My turn. Thank you for coming. All 30 of you. <laughs> I don't know why it is, you know, and prophecies are less than 100% attendance. They fuss at you. What's that wrong with you? Why don't you come to our classroom? You're the guys that came to class. Why should I fuss at you? All right. Quick review. When we had members that were torqued, shame, 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 we had different ways of analyzing them. If, for example, you had a roof truss with a channel on the top or a wide flange on the top with the gravity load down on the decking above the flange and all of the gravel and tar, stuff like that, then you will have this case where the this angle right here is theta. And therefore the load is on the beam at an angle theta. We have decided to break it up into two components. He shows you that the vertical force will be designed into the beam just as always. You could pick up the horizontal load and put it and bend it about the weak axis which is relatively new for you, but you'd still have to take care of this torsion inside of the beam. Now they use channels all the time, that's, and that's one of the things they're more commonly used for. Yes. I will see me after class about the applications of when you should use channels and I-beams and wide flanges and Z-shapes and... Here's the way we have decided it's in our best interest and your peers to analyze a case one loaded beam. Go ahead and design it for strong axis bending. Take into account lateral torsional buckling or anything else, web flange buckling, you name it. And then take the horizontal load and rather than actually putting a moment on this and trying to design the whole thing, just leave the load on the top of the wide flange but only take half of its bending strength about the weak axis. Actually, of course, this loads up the T. That T pulls over, pulls this T with it a little bit, so you probably get some strength out of there. But just taking half of it is on the conservative side for all cases. That's the way it's analyzed. Loading case one, analysis case one. Loading case two, where you're just putting the load off center, but you don't have any weak axis bending per se, but you do have some torque, P times Z, loading case two. Our best guess on how to analyze case two is just go ahead and design the vertical component of the whole thing, the whole load about the strong axis, plus go ahead and call that a little T, half of a wide flange, put the bending moment in effect in this. This is what you called P times Z was the bending moment you wanted to resist, divided by the distance. This is H0, is from the centroid of the flanges. It's not the full depth they find is not fair to take. Put that much force, moment divided by moment arm, on the T, and analyze this T for that force. The bottom one, of course, would be the same. That's analysis case two. Then he talks about when this commonly shows up is in a roof purlin. That's the beams that span between the main truss members across from a truss joist. Uh, these are also called bar joists. They will get a lot of times use angles in the top. They look like this from the end. You've put a, got a pair of angles. You wrap this bar, bend it, bend it, bend it, bend it. You put them all together and you weld this piece right in here. It becomes a very efficient and very inexpensive way to hold loads. And they're ugly as sin, but nobody cares because you can't see them. They're in the roof. A lot of times, though, the horizontal part of the load that's going to be on this beam right here 
And of course, you're already going to design it uh, for the vertical load. The horizontal part, parallel to the joist, really bends this thing seriously about its weak axis. And you can't hardly make it from this joist to the next joist. So what they do is they'll put in what they call sag rods. And they'll put them over this point also. But the main purpose is to take this 15-foot channel bent about its weak axis, or if it's a T, and make it shorter. Around the top, Let's see if I got any more. Here we go. I got a picture. Here we go. Around the top, you let each other, uh, each of them pull on each other. So you put one across there to keep these from bending. And then here the sag rod goes all the way down, and the sag rod goes all the way down. There'll be one of these every maybe 10 feet, whatever you can live with. This is it looking from the side. You have the sag rods over the truss members. You'll also have one supporting it in the middle so that when this beam bends, it ha it's supported at the halfway mark. Or you may put in more than that, depending. Now, that makes it a statically indeterminate beam, but we know how to do statically indeterminate beams, so that's okay, but the, the moments would be for something that's got, uh, even if this is the end of the channel, you'd have a reaction, a reaction, and another support. So that would be like an uh, indeterminate structure. It's kind of what they look like. They... You know, they, they don't make this all one long rod. Uh, you could try that. The people in the Hyde Regency thought about that and didn't do it and uh, had a disaster on their hands because of it. But if you use one rod all the way down, then you've got to take one of these nuts and thread it up here about 30 feet. Then you've got to put the channel and the washers on there. Then you've got to thread that nut up about 30 feet. Then the next one down, you'll have to thread it up 20 feet, but that's unacceptable. So they'll come in pairs, kind of like this, a little closer together. Here's an example. He's going to analyze some uh, beams that are bent about both axes. Of course, is how we got in this in the first place. Finding all the loads. He has uniform loads. You, your 305 prof showed you how to do this. Uh, I'll leave that to you comes up with some number of pounds per square foot. That load is going straight down. It's going to have to be broken up into two components, one perpendicular to the beams, one parallel to the uh, roof. And uh, bending moments, WL squared over 8. It's a moment inside of a simply supported beam. Here was the, the beam that wasn't 15 feet long because it was supported by a sag rod about its weak axis. So I'll leave that to you. He cheats and uses tables right out of your handbook. So he didn't have to solve for the moments inside of a statically indeterminate structure that was supported on the ends and then another sag rod here. Uh, you just simply get the book, find out how far it is between the end points, and the moments are listed like 0.7 WL squared, 1.25 WL squared, and you just pull the moments right out of the tables, right on up to many spans. That's if you have concentrated loads. This is if you have uniform loads. This is if you have two loads inside there. This is if you have three loads inside there. On your page 3-212. So just starting from... You taking your 305, 345, and you have the loads, and you found the moments inside of these beams. Now I come into play. You have a strong axis. It happened to turn out to be 441 pounds a foot, simply supported on the ends. Had a brace rod going this way, but that doesn't help this thing. It's still got a full 15 foot span between brace points. WL squared over 8. There was your W that you got from 345. It's 15 feet long. WL squared over 8 is your request about the x-axis. Your weak axis bending. Here you had uh, uniform load on it. 
It was seven and a half feet long, supported, and the WL squared over eight. I had a mistake in this book. Uh, the length was, I forget, seven and a half feet. The request turned out to be one kip foot, which is, Miss Sandy, that's not much. The 15 sure, or the 12 sure controls. Well, this is strong axis, and this would be about the weak axis. So starting with those two numbers, we're going to go see if that beam is adequate. Now, right off the bat, he does a number on us. He says, select a trial shape. Okay, I understand that's what design is. Unless you got some tables or something that'll handle this stuff, you're going to be selecting a trial shape, and you're actually going to analyze your proposed design. And he says, why don't we try a C10 by 15.3? that will handle an unbraced length of seven and a half feet and give us a moment that's 12. Um, but he says, no, no, the, the one I'm proposing doesn't give you a 12. I say, well, okay, I guess you're going to make it a little bigger than 12. He says, yeah. He says, I'm going to make it uh, 33. What? He says, well, I already tried a whole bunch of them that was around 12 and 14 and 18 and 27. And he says, I'll tell you now, they don't any of them work. I say, well, how am I supposed to do that? He says, you're supposed to do the same thing. And with experience, you won't pick a 12 when you start. And it's bent about the weak axis, which is horrible. Okay. In other words, I'll get this with experience. What are my students supposed to do? Well, they have about the same experience you do, practically none compared to people who do this for a living. He says, time to pick a beam. If you want to, tell them the answer and let them pick that beam, you know, so they don't waste a lot of time and they still get the idea. Sounds like a plan to me. But I can tell you nothing more than this beam happens to work. Now, where he got that from is he was tinkering around In his, how much moment will these things carry for different items with an unbraced length of seven and a half? And he comes up here with seven and a half, and he found a channel right here would work, would give him 33. Having already been down on a previous page up to about 15 and 20 and 25 and going through all of the work involved, and it didn't work. He says, I'd like you to try this one. Okay, well, I'd like to know how strong it is. He says, well, I'll tell you how strong it is. It is 33. It's about how strong you can have for the capacity of that shape and take into account lateral torsional buckling of the shape. Got about 33.2, he says, now he must have worked this out using the equations because he sure didn't get that off this figure where you and I just looked at. Uh, 3-18. Where did he get that from? He says, okay, is that a table? I don't know either. Doesn't matter where you get it from. It's okay with me. That is. Okay. Well, that's for a C sub B of 1, and that's what we've got. He says, since we got a uniform load on this beam, you can have a 1.3 times that above what you get in the tables. So let me see, uh, why would he have an extra 30%? Now, here are our values of C sub B for simply supported beams. In this case, it was laterally supported at the midpoint. It has a length of the full 15 feet, but it's braced there with a sag rod. And he says you can have 30% bigger than the tables, than the graph gives you. All right, I'll, I'll take that. So this is another page with more drawings on it. This is an old, old text. This is the old text. Yours has all the same numbers they still do. 
Here's where he tried this. He says, C sub E is a 1. You, the tables give you, the, the graphs give you this, but you can have more. Therefore, you can have 1.3 times 33. I say, wow, well, man, this sounds like overkill for a 12. He says, well, you wait till you get to the weak axis part, you'll see. So I'm going to be able to have 42.9 kip feet, and it won't laterally torsionally buckle. Now, that doesn't say that it won't flange buckle. Well, yes, it does, because the shape doesn't have a little F on it. This doesn't say that the plastic moment will take it. That's a good point. We've still got to check and see what the plastic moment is. That's when this table... That's when this thing really does a lot of lying. When it comes down and says, you can have 33 and it won't laterally torsionally buckle. And when you take the 33 and you multiply it times 1.3, it comes out in here somewhere. Way above, beep, the plastic moment. Check that. Incidentally, we might as well check it while we're here. Uh, the plastic moment for this shape is 42, 43, around 43, something like that. These things have 0.75 increments. Boy, that's horrible to try and figure out. So, you know, pick a number. So it comes and says uh, from the uniform load table. Well, gee, I just got the M plastic. What, what is this uniform load table? for C shapes. Uh, some kind of a table tells you how strong C's are for various lengths and things like that, probably. Let's see here. Here are dimensions for C shapes. There's your 10 by 15.3. There's the next page with Z's and section moduluses. That's all good stuff. There, There's one. Tells you how much maximum total uniform load you can have. Here's what he's using out of the table, since he's got a channel, and since it's got the right stress on it, he's going to take a 15.3 and find out how much P sub B, M sub P he can have. It's 43. That's the plastic moment. That's where he's getting the 43. And here's how much shear capacity it has. Now, where did I get it? Because I didn't get it from there. I got max is equal to I got P sub B M sub plastic is for uniform tables he got what? Here's where I got it right here. I got Z sub X out of the table. And to find phi sub B M sub plastic X, I took the point 0.9 times the Z times the steel divided by 12, 42.93 kip feet. Same as he got. However, since that, since you're proposing 42.9 is the limit for lateral torsional buckling, or 43 is the plastic. 43 plastic is okay. You still take the lower of the two, 42.9. We already said it's compact. This is your XX supply. Now you're going to do your YY supply. This is relatively new. It's new in that it's got the same idea, except you don't have to do lateral torsional buckling. And you have to be careful for deflection. For the plastic moment, which you can run right on up to the plastic moment unless it gets too much deflection. 0. 0.9 times 36, there's your plastic moment. I'm sorry, there's your Z for your plastic moment. It came from the table where we pull the numbers out of the dimensions table. Uh, not on that page. You go, Y, Y axis, Z, 2.34 for our shape. 2.34 gives you 6.3 kip foot of capacity supply. Remember what you're trying to dig out here. You're trying to dig out the strength, the capacity, the supply about both axes. 
then you need the demand about both axes. And I just went ahead and did it. He says, but since this is this is this over this and that's bigger than that, then you've got to use the deflection limit. I, I don't get that. I really don't. I'd say all you got to do is you just do the limit for deflections. Your deflection equation in the manual, incidentally, and this number doesn't appear. If you're going to use it, you better write it down. It's going to be 1.6 times the first yield elastic moment, F sub Y times, that's yield, times S sub G, that's elastic section modulus, excuse me, about the Y axis. And then, of course, it also needs a 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 1.6, F sub Y, S sub Y, 4.97. When he had to do the same thing right here, same thing I did. So now we know two numbers. We got supplies. Now what we got to do is we got to figure out what is requested. Did we already figure out some of the requests? Yeah, we already have the request. Those are what we came in the door with. We had a request uh, x-axis, 12.4, and we had a request y-axis of 1.034. So now we're ready to drop them into the interaction equation. There's your request, 12.4 and 1.034 requests. Here are your supplies. Your strong axis supply was the 42.9. I can make sure this is back on where you can see it. The x-axis supply turned out to be 42.9. The y-axis supply was 4.698. Things okay. Now, I says, I say it's okay. It's not okay. Something's fishy here. That dang thing's got a load on the top flange. Huh. What are we supposed to do for things that got loads on the top flange? Surely I wouldn't have not noticed this for 40 years. What do we do when things have loads on the top flange? What do we do when things have load on the top flange? How do we analyze them? Give you a hint. give you a hint. What do you do to the thing when you put the load on it? What do you say its strength is? C sub y? C sub y over 2. Okay. So now then, I'm hoping this was done back here. The looky there. There's your bending strength that you told me you were going to get out of a whole wide flange, a whole channel or wide flange, whatever that gets us was a channel, and you're only going to take half of its strength. That's going to take care of the fact that you didn't put the load uh, symmetrically on the weak axis bending force, and it's okay. Shear. Shear was, we already said, 0 0.441 kips per foot. The thing was 15 feet long, even though it's braced in the middle. Divided by 2 is 3.31 kips. It says you can go to uniform load tables. You could also go to the, Z well, you can't go to the Z tables. We're not talking about that kind of steel. Let's see if we got some, uni oh, that's right. The uniform load tables were where, where we got the bending strength for the channel. That's the properties of the channel. There's the uniform load tables. This came out of an old book. They look at how they mismarked. They showed this and called it that. So errors do occur. And how strong it is, V sub V, V sub N, 46.7, a little bit bigger than 2 or 3, good in shear. Questions? Nothing new. That's one reason it's boring. Until they pay you, then, of course, it's not at all boring. All right. Here are your notes. Same thing. Like I say, I just don't have my pictures on all of this. Your book. 
bending strength of other sh other shapes we don't do we're struggling to keep up with where we're supposed to be anyway now then beam columns this is where there's no more problem than there is before because all they ask you is the axial load you ought to be able to tell me the load in a column the uh, bending moment request about the strong axis, well, you've had 345. Bending moment about a weak axis, and you've had 345. Then you need to know the capacity of the thing in axial compression. Well, you've had that back in the first of this class. Then you need to know the capacity about the strong axis. That's that lateral torsional buckling and all that kind of good stuff. And then you need to know the capacity about the weak axis. That's the last stuff we did. So there's nothing new going on here. The only problem with it is that's a lot of stuff. Got a lot of stuff to remember. It all comes into play. It's like taking a final over everything in the class instead of just the last third or something. It is. It's uh, challenging. He mentions that most beams and columns, or many can be uh, just designed as a beam or a column, because that's so much predominantly what's going on that there's not much else that you need to worry about. But some of them, in fact many of them, are subjected to both bending and axial at the same time. And in that case, they're called beam columns. You can read all the reasons you're doing this. We already mentioned the interaction equation. If you were going to do axial only, you would say that piece of U has to be less than, that's request, the design, P sub C, P sub N. You can tell me that ratio has to be less than 100% of the strength extracted from the available strength. Same way if you had all of a sudden added moment about an axis, it makes sense to assume that you could probably take the, in your case, doggone those, AI, uh, those ASD people, your A sub P sub U over P of the column, phi P sub nominal of the column, plus M sub U divided by phi, this would be a phi in columns, this would be a phi in bending, times m sub nominal, you would expect that ratio, the sum of that, to be less than 100%. And if you had a third axis, you'd stick in a third term. In its full glory, for you and me, without the terms that are good for ASD and LRFD, this ratio plus that ratio plus that ratio, you'd think it ought to be less than one. they think it ought to be because if they find a practical reason where their number can go up to 1.2 and give me a little explanation plus a whole bunch of experimental verification, I'm in there. And they say, well, we got a lot of experimental verification. We have no idea why. I'm in there anyway. You know, hopefully some year they'll figure out why. But until then, if you can guarantee me this can run up to 1.2, I'm on it. Then we propose money for research. Now, sadly, it really breaks down into two cases. If you have a heavily loaded column that also got a fair amount of bending in it, and the amount of capacity you extract in that shape is greater than 20% of the available in compression. Then they call that a heavily loaded, it's a beam column, but it's a, like a, it's a heavily loaded beam. And you have to admit to the full extraction of strength because you put axial load in it. But... You bring the bending moments in, you only have to fess up to eight ninths. Not a lot, but it's there. The strength is there. So good enough, I'll take it. What happens if it's not heavily loaded? What happens if this number is less than 0.2? 
Well, if you try and extract less than 10% of the axial capacity of the beam out of the mix, then it's called a lightly loaded beam column. And you don't have to admit to all of it. I said, well, it wasn't much there in the first place. He says, you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But I'm just telling you, if you don't have much in the first place, you only have to admit to half. And We will back you up 100%. It won't collapse. It won't kill anybody. And uh, you will have a lighter and a less expensive structure. But you do have to admit to all of the capacity being extracted, bending strong, bending weak. Those are the generic terms here. You're in my terms because I'm just not familiar with those. You know, I'm familiar. I know what P sub U. I know what M sub U is. I know what M sub R for anybody is. It's M sub U for me and M sub something else for the loud stress people. That's your equation. This is what's going to be listed in the book, uh, in the specs. And right under it, they'll tell you what it is for us and what it is for the allied stress people. And so you should be okay. But if you want to write that down in a book so you don't even look at this one, you know everything. I know him. I know that guy. I know that lady. I know that dog. I know that horse. I, it's up to you. I got that twice. 302. How come he's got it twice? I have no idea. Oh, that's right. He he lists it for for you and me. Then he lists it for those people. These equations are on page 16.173. They're equation H11A and H11B. So an example. Okay, not gonna do that example? Okay, explain to them kind of why this eight ninths and a half is probably in there. You remember in 305, I don't remember if we still cover this in 305, but they are what they call uh, failure criteria. One of them is the maximum shear stress failure criteria. One of them, the one that we very commonly use, is a maximum stress criteria. Well, once the stress reaches F sub Y, it's all over. Some of them are, one of them is how much energy. They think that the thing really starts to come apart when uh, energy stored in something, regardless of how you stressed it, uh, reaches some limit. That one happens to be this one, uh, one half, sigma, so and so, so and so, so and so. It plots such that, and they find this is really true for steel and for some materials, this effect really is there. You can put sigma y and then you got to stop sigma yield in one direction. But if you put a little stress in the next direction, you can do it and you can even put a little more. Because at this point, you haven't yet hit the maximum energy that's stored in the piece. And so some weird things like that do go on. And it's something like that. Someone who didn't know, or here's, here's the maximum stress theory. When you reach sigma y, you got to quit. When you reach sigma y, you got to quit. And what am I saying now? I don't know about in between there. But, you know, when you uh, have other combinations there, you're going to have to give me some uh, stress transformation equations. But if you hit sigma y in any plane, you got to quit. This one says you really don't have to. So into the manual for nothing more than just a reference so you know where all this stuff is. And we've already seen it in our book. 16.173 shows you in terms of everybody's terms, predominantly a column, predominantly a beam. This is the criteria for that breakpoint. Defined all terms. P sub R, required strength for LRFD, 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 LRFD. Here's for ASD. Other stuff. Probably will be back to some of this later. 
because we have no interest in any of it just up till today. So here's an example. I've got a beam. Ooh, look at that. It's got axial loads on it, ah, and it's got some uh, horizontal loads on it, some bending moments. Now, the bending moment, let me check the bending moment right quick. Uh, I'll have to factor these two loads, and then I'll put the factored loads here, and that'll cause me a couple of factored reactions. And the moment underneath this will be the maximum, so it would be a reaction times eight and a half feet. That's how much moment we're talking about. Now, the question is, how is that person going to orient this beam column. Well, my guess is since he's bending the beam, he will load it from the side. If he wants like this, from the from about the strong axis, he's welcome to put the 25.2 in this direction if he wants to, but I think he'd be crazy to bend it about the strong axis with that big load rather than bend it about the, about the weak axis for that load rather than the strong axis. And so that's what the author assumes, and that's what we'll assume. We're given all of the loads, dead service 35, live service 99 axial, dead service 5, uh, concentrated load on a simply supported beam, uh, dead service, all these still need to be factored. Here's the factor for these two axial loads. 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live gives us 200.4. That's what you should be showing on your column. Uh, uh, bending load, 1.2 times 5 plus 1.6 times 12. That's 25.2. That's where that 25.2 came from on these pictures. M max is PL over 4. In this case, P sub U is 200. We're going to bend it about its strong axis. How's it going to buckle? Barry? How's it going to buckle? Let me repeat. It's going to be bent about its strong axis. It's a column or a beam. Pinned on this end, pinned on the other end. How's it going to buckle? Strong axis? That's a good guess. But out of 50 50, you know, it could be 50 50 chance it's wrong. Where, how do most, axis, most columns buckle? About their weak axis, that's right. Now, they don't always buckle about their weak axis. If you brace them about their weak axis in the middle, or twice or three times, then they may pop over and have to buckle about their strong axis. This guy has no evidence of any of that kind of stuff going on. It's just hanging out in the air. So although the bending is about the x-axis, the buckling will occur, what did I say? Although the bending is about the strong axis, the buckling will occur about the weak axis. So if you were to look at this column right here, this is what you'd see. You'd see a column that looks like this. You would see that flange, and you would see that flange. And it would bend parallel to the web. It would deflect parallel to the web. It would not, you couldn't see it buckle. It would buckle out of the page about its weak axis. Impossible. And the reason is you go get me a yardstick and you don't tinker with the middle. You can support the ends. and You put some load on it and you say, well, I'm just going to put enough load till it buckles about the strong axis. About 50 times lower than that before you get there, it'll go to the side. And you'll say, stop that. And you'll say, let's try that again. And you'll know, buckle about the weak axis. And you say, I'm going to kick... Uh, well, you'll say something ugly to him. And he goes, he's going to buckle about the weak axis because there's less buckling strength for this support system than about the strong axis.
You can calculate how much load it would take to buckle it about the strong axis, but no one but you will have an interest in that number. All right, now let me tell you a problem you've got here, which he said, just omit it for now. As delivered, when you put a load on this thing, these things aren't straight. I mean, they're pretty straight. They look straight, but you check them out. They're not straight. That's why you put this thing here on it. And I think it covered up a few other sins also. But when you gave me the buckling strength, the oiler's buckling load, you put a .866 on it and dropped it down below oiler's or Timoshenko's equation. Now you're fixing to even make matters worse. In this problem, you're fixing to put a force on the beam. You're going to kick this thing out, I don't know, not just maybe two-tenths of an inch, quarter inch. You're going to kick this sucker out maybe an inch, inch and a half. Depends on how long it is and how big the load is and how strong the beam is. The point is that you have an added moment, P delta, which you took into account. You now have an added load, P delta. See the moment arm? P delta that you haven't accounted for. But this is the first time you put any horizontal loads on my columns either. But... Plan on it. You're not getting away with that. You're going to have to give me a P delta effect. If you took that same total load and spread it out into a uniform load, that would be a lot easier on the beam. but would cause it to deflect a lot less. Uh, this deformation, you know, I really wish I'd have written that down. I didn't think about it, but and I don't know it off the top of my head, the deflection under a concentrated load on a simply supported beam, I guarantee it's a whole lot less. And I think this one's WL squared over 8. No, that's for a cantilever beam. I don't know. But I can guarantee you this, if that total load is spread out, this is a lot smaller than this. But in both cases, you must account for that, that P delta effect. We're going to ignore it in this problem only. So here we go. I love this text, but I sure wish he'd have kind of reminded me along the way, what in the devil are we doing? He tells me what to do from the column load column from the column load tables, you know, blah blah blah. Since bending is about the blah blah blah. Here's what he's doing. This is calculating the available axial buckling strength about the YY axis since it's unsupported from top to bottom. Were it supported in the middle, then I would have to study YY axing, YY buckling about something half as long, and then strong axis for the full length. We've done a lot of that. There isn't anything new going on in this stuff. So calculating the available axle, he says, why don't you just go straight to the load tables? I say, Sounds like sounds good. Um, it's a W10 by 49. They probably got tables for that. 17 foot long about its weak axis means I don't have to correct by finding uh, phony KL. See if I happen to bring that with me. Ta -da! Available strength, axial compression, 50 KSI steel, W10 by 49 is right there, 17 feet long, capacity is 405. 405. I says, you're bending this thing about the strong axis, for heaven's sakes. Don't go get me a bunch of weak axis numbers unless you really plan on doing something stupid like that. Putting the load... Uh, along the 90 degree away from the strong axis. Okay, gotcha. Bending's about the strong axis. That That's good. That means I get to use those graphs. They don't have any of those for weak axis bending. C sub B is a 1 for the graphs, so we may get some, some extra here. I don't know. Uh, unbraced length 17 feet. W10 by 49 have to track that rascal down, probably what you would do is you would go find a W10 by 49's plastic moment and track it down like that. It may be on 10 pages later. Uh, no, actually, it's still on this page, so we're pretty lucky. 
And 17 feet tells me that that 10 by 49 is not the lightest. He says, well, that's only if you're talking about just bending. There's no telling if this is the lightest, including bending about two axes plus axial. I understand that. It's got a strength of 197 with a C sub B of 1. All right. Uh, 17 feet, 197. That's what he got, 197. 197. He says, for your end conditions, what are they? I said, well, it was uniformly loaded and it was pinned on the ends. Uh, he says, C sub B is 1.32. I said, where the devil would you get that from? I said, if it was me, I'd get the moment of the quarter plus the moment of the half. Uh, so, 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 12.5, blah, blah, blah. He says, it's in a figure. There it is. Oh, I take it back. It wasn't uniformly loaded, was it? It had that concentrated load. 0.32. That's how much extra moment you get. Don't forget this may lie to you. So I'm going to go take my 192. I'm going to multiply it times 1.32, and I can have 260. He says, you can have 260 under what conditions? I say, oh, well, okay. Unless that's bigger than the plastic moment. He says, okay, don't forget that. Says, what is the plastic moment? He says, you can also get that from the beam design chart. You can indeed. It's right there, 226.5033. I don't know where he got all that accuracy from. Man, he must have some really sharp eyes. Uh, it says, also obtained from the beam design chart. I don't believe it. He worked it out. You know he did. So the design moment must be limited to this number here. Here are the factored loads. These, of course, were given to us. There's your request for column capacity. Was We said 200. We factored these. We got 25.2. Maximum moment due to the 25.2 was WL over 4, 107. Drop it in the magic equation. Uh, the real question is, is this, which is this, which is this, greater than two-tenths? That's the question. That way we know which equation to use. So we work out the request over the supply. We used 49% of it just in axial. That's a column. They have a little beam flavor to it, but that's a column. Therefore, we have to confess to all of our sins in axial loading, request over supply. We only have to admit to eight-ninths of our bending moment request. There was your WL over 4. Over your supply, there's your 226. The beam is okay. I, the book probably ought to every now and then have some things that just seriously don't work, so you don't think they ought to always work. That's what students, you know, first off think, gee, the problem didn't work. The beam was no good, especially on an exam. That bothers you a lot. It shouldn't. Nine or half the time you get things that don't work for a while. See you next time. I'm going to be gone this afternoon consulting up in Dallas. So if you were going to plan, come see me with your exam to discuss it. Going to have to wait till Monday. About Friday, I hope by then you've got it kind of settled. Oh, no. Thank you. I'm working on the rise of design for my senior design project. Yeah. I'm doing the Von Mises stretches right now. Did you get the, the page that you showed on it in class? That from our or is it from no, no. But I got 305 books coming out my ears with that in it. Uh, like I say, I'm probably not even going to go back to the office. So you, you got, can you get it Monday? Um, I'll probably have it done by this weekend, which isn't on Fridays. So. Okay. Well, do you have a 305 text? Yeah, I do. From, That's. I took that with you. Is this from our 305 text? You know, I don't remember. I just stole it. From some place. Is this what you need? Yeah. This page? Yeah. Return Are you it. Sure? Yeah, just return it later. Okay. I'll bring it back on That's time. not a problem. Thank you. Sure thing.
Yes, sir. Can you explain the condition again that we, we check the point two? Hang on just a second. All right, the condition that we checked uh, right. close to the end. Where's the point? The is, it said is. That's right. See, the real, the real question is, if you use more than 20% of the column's capacity with your load, right. you, we have found that you really have to use the equation P sub U over that full blast, but you only need to confess to eight-ninths of the moment. If it's, if it's less than 20%, you only have to admit to half of the number, but in that case, you have to admit to 100% of this. Those, those are the two. Now, why it's a break point at point two? You yeah, know, it just seems like it's so low that... <laughs> well, you, you, know, just, you, just, you just have to go in. Well, in our case, it is. But that's just because this is a real column. I mean, it was out in the corner of the building yeah uh -huh. and it's heavily loaded in axial force and there are some moments coming in on it it's those side loads those are probably wind loads you know the sheeting on the side transmitted to some kind of a beam that hold the sheets on the side of the building and they come in there in the middle of our column and they put a 25 kip load on the side but it's mostly a column yeah just because of the loads it's carrying now that same problem if you told me that the numbers they gave you, this was 20, it was probably really a beam that was a statically indeterminate beam and it had some axial force in it. And that happened to be lightly loaded. And so when you came down here and you took 20 over 40, you'd only get about 5%. And since that's less than two tenths, I'd say that's a beam. Effects are the, the bending effects are greater. Massive, that's correct. And which means you've got to admit to 100% of your bending, but that little bit of axial that you do have in there, you only have to admit to half of it. That like another um, like another Christmas present that we get. Well, no, that's, uh, well, I don't know, you know, all of those gifts, all of those constants that let you raise number from the theory number because you didn't bend it as badly as you could or all of those kind of reasons, those are really there. And this one, this only, I guess the only difference is your bending strength is really there, except the theory is wrong because of your supports. That's the Christmas present you get. This the, the Christmas present is here all the time. In other words, you don't multiply it times something to increase it because the theories doesn't really apply to your support system. I don't think that's answering the question, but that's, I should have just said, yeah. Yeah, depending on the case, we have either full, either full um, accurate. And uh, reduced bending. Uh huh. Or the other way around. That's right. I guess I'll go in and read a little bit of the theory. Well, yeah. hey, that never hurts. I like that idea. Let me close this out and I'll be with you in just a second.